<laughs> um, if you don't mind, we already prayed. I'm going to say another quick prayer myself, uh, just because I don't know how I can continue unless I do. So God, please help me to um, say what is right and true and say it articulately and help it to seep into the minds of the hearers. And I pray if they don't accept it now, uh, they would accept it later. And if I say anything wrong, that they would reject that. Thank you for this opportunity. Amen. So, um, I feel pretty good right now, but I may not at the end of the speech, and you might not either. Not because I'm trying to disappoint you, but because honestly, I don't have anything that could truly be described as positive to say. That presentation Jane just gave was pretty positive. It looks like they don't have a constitutional case against me, but you never know what might happen. But my speech here today is meant to challenge you, and that is not always comfortable. I know it's not comfortable for me. It probably won't be comfortable for you. And as I go through this, these points I'm trying to make, describing my case and why I do what I do and why I think pro-lifers should change doing what they do, certain uh, justifications against me will arise in your mind. Okay, it's going to happen. I'm going to say that before it, it starts. Um, some of you uh, will say, what does this guy know about ending abortion? He's too young. He hasn't been around long enough. I'm not as long as I young as I may look, I'm 41, uh, but I will point out that I have been doing anti-abortion work quasi-professionally for about 14 years, so my finger's kind of on the pulse of this thing, and I, I think I have an idea about some of the mistakes that we've made. You might say, well, he's not from Maryland, he's from Virginia. Admittedly, it is a different state, but I do a lot of pro-life work in Maryland, so I kind of know what's happening here. I'm aware of how bad it is, and I used to live here for about three years, so, you know, Take that into consideration. And you might say, this guy is asking us to do things and he's proposing stuff that I can't do and he doesn't know my situation. He doesn't have a wife and kids. And that's right, I do not have a wife and kids yet. But I know lots of anti-abortion people who do, who are doing the things I'm suggesting that everybody do or be willing to do. And if you think that causing, inadvertently causing inconvenience or persecution or grievance to fall on the heads of your family is a justification not to love your neighbor like yourself. Well, then you have to tell every priest or pastor or uh, dissident in communist China or anywhere else that they're bad parents because they're causing problems to come on the heads of their family because of their advocacy for other people. And I don't think we want to do that. So, um, without further ado, this is the title of my talk. It's called Interposition. Interposition meaning putting yourself between a, a victim and those who would hurt them. What you just saw. Oh, God. Did you want to turn the lights back on? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so what you just saw was a uh, FBI SWAT team carrying out an arrest on me and my housemates. I, I, at that time, I lived with, uh, well, I still live with four people to keep the rent down out there. It's expensive. So um, on the morning of uh, the 30th of March, uh, 2022, I was, uh, I'd actually fallen asleep on the couch in the front room, and I awoke just about before 6 o'clock, I think, still rather disoriented. And then I heard a loud banging on the front door and a voice screaming, open up, FBI. And I didn't know whether to believe them or not. I, anybody can say they're the FBI. I'm not going to just open the door to a random stranger. But on the anticipation that it might be law enforcement, I did not at first open the door. I went to my housemate's room. He's had some trouble with the law. I thought they were there for him. Okay. So I woke him up. I didn't want him to be woken up, pulled out of bed, you know, without his pants on or something. So... He got out. He was the guy wearing the pro-life shirt there, the first man in the door frame. They took him out, and then they proceeded to take the rest of us out. So they had us all back up and uh, be you know, handcuffed like that. I had a phone in my hand, which I put down on the ground when they ordered me to, aimed it towards the front door, and incredibly, it still captured this footage, and they didn't take it, you know? So that's am amazing. Um, I never saw a warrant. They said they had one. Uh, they wouldn't tell me what was going on either. I still thought they were there for my housemate until 
They say, we got Darnell. He's the jackpot. And I'm like, oh, crap. Okay. They want me. No, they broke, they broke the door down. No. By the time I got back, they busted the door down. They still haven't paid for it either. Um, I mean, I, I assume the FBI are professionals. They're not gonna, they're not trigger happy or anything. But I'm sure if I had made any really quick movements or done anything like that, they might have shot me. They would have been within their so-called professional rights. Yeah, didn't you see guns? Oh yeah, they had weapons. Yeah, and of course they had that bright light flashing in our faces. So my, no, I couldn't. I couldn't see it. They weren't wearing that. I remember one officer's name, but he wasn't the ones that were banging on the door of that sort. No, it was nothing like that. So uh, apparently, as and they put me on the car and took me away. My housemate said that they brought some sort of a drone into the house to search for bombs or whatever. And uh, eventually they released their handcuffs. You know, they detained all four of them, not knowing what had happened to me. And I was taken, uh, not blindfolded, but I was taken into D.C. somewhere and in processed at one facility, fingerprinted, photographed, put me back in a car, handcuffed me again, took me to another facility, FBI headquarters, in processed me there, photographed, fingerprinted and everything. The whole time I'm telling the FBI, I know this has something to do with pro-life work, so I'm telling them this is wrong, you guys shouldn't be doing this, you ought to repent, come to Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they stayed quiet the whole time. They didn't really like it very much, you know. And, and that is a good point. By the way, that's a good point. You don't just do what your boss tells you to do, which I'm going to touch on later on here. Um, like I said, I never saw a warrant. I never saw any paperwork about what was happening. I was never read any rights. At the very, I sat on a metal cot for three or four hours. If you ever get arrested in D.C., try not to sleep on the cots because they're metal, sheets of metal that are uh, twisted in such a way that if you press on them the wrong way, they, 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 they bend. Okay, they like uh, they they bend from concave to convex, and the noise that they make that sheet of metal will, will wake the dead. It's like an ex- a sonic boom reverberating throughout the entire cell block. You got to imagine what it's like at night with twenty guys in there, some of them on drugs, banging <laughs> these things constantly. And, okay, so ev- eventually, um, I pressed one of the FBI agents in a, a while, and he did admit kind of what it was. I'll get to that in a second. But I didn't get any paperwork. I I eventually did get uh, into a room where I spoke to an attorney um, on a phone, and he read me my release terms. Uh, Right now, I can travel anywhere in the lower uh, 48 as long as I tell my case manager where I'm going, uh, which is a lot better than some of the other people that were arrested that day. And, um, you know, after that, they... You know, after about 12 hours in their custody, they released me. When they release you from police custody or FBI custody, if you don't know, they don't take you back to where you were arrested. They're not that consi- they're not that considerate. They just release you onto the street, and they don't they take away your shoelaces because you might strangle yourself with your shoelaces or something. You might go Epstein Epstein or something. Um, so I'm walking around the streets of D.C. in pajamas, in you know, 50 degree weather and shoes with no laces. And my ID card just flopping around here. I look like a homeless guy. It was kind of probably kind of funny. No, they didn't give me any of that. No, this is this is COVID still. So they're not giving you. They're not that hands on yet. Or maybe they they just don't do that at all. I don't know. The, the whole story is kind of bizarre. Yeah, I think so. Well, I made it back home by you know public bus and walking. My housemates were happy to see me. But I still didn't know exactly what had happened. Okay, I knew it had something to do with pro-life work. I found out later that day that eight other individuals, uh, acquaintances of mine, had also been arrested in similar ways throughout the country. People coming with guns, banging on their doors, putting them in custody, taking them away. Um, And then several days later, we received our indictment charges, and I found out I was being charged with uh, conspiracy to violate rights and conspiracy to um, break the FACE Act. Okay, so there you have that. Altogether, it was a very rough job, I think. We are being charged with face because of this incident. 
the the uh, the news story from LifeSite News is from 2022 after the arrest, but the photograph is from 2020. I'm not going to divulge too many details. I'm not going to talk about the case too great. I don't want to incriminate anybody, myself or anyone else. But essentially, uh, the nine of us that were arrested, plus some other people, were present at what you might call a pro-life a rescue at a Washington, D.C. abortion clinic in 2020. Okay? And rescue, in our language, can mean kind of a broad spectrum of things. Uh, but what we're being charged with is what Jane talked about, uh, obstructing and preventing people physically from accessing reproductive, reproductive health services. The FACE Act, as she pointed out, uh, it only, you know, here's relevant parts of the FACE Act. Hope you can see that. For a first-time offense, you're only going to get maybe like one year in jail. But they've added this conspiracy to violate rights charge on top of it, so it bumps it up to 11 years. I don't know how that's going to play down. It may be thrown out of court. You don't know. It'll be God willing. But it's possible. We could get quite a, a bit of time in jail because who knows in this government. So, um, there are currently, by last count, 25 people in the nation under the same charges, FACE Act charges. Okay? Uh, these are 16 of them. I couldn't get photographs for all of them. I didn't put my photograph on there because you can see me. But... You know, I know a number of these people, some better than others, and I know some of the other people that don't appear here. All of them face similar charges, 11 years in prison. Notice there are men up there. There are women. There are old people who might be retirees. There are young people who are just beginning their careers and their, their lives. There are uh, Protestants and there are Catholics. There are very conservative people and very liberal people. There are folks who don't have any job at all and they just do pro-life work. And there are folks that have a family, wife and kids, and regular jobs and stand to lose a lot from, you know, from these charges. My point is, there's no absolute justification for not doing the right thing, whether you have all sorts of obligations to others or not. Very often, there may be a reason for taking risks that put you and, yes, your family at inconvenience or risk. Nobody gets a complete pass from doing the right thing. 2022 was when all these folks were arrested. It's kind of a banner year for arrests on the FACE Act charges. Since the FACE Act was put in place in 1996, I don't know that more than maybe one person has actually been convicted of it. There's been people charged with it. Most of the charges were rather spurious and they were thrown out of court or settled outside of court or something like that. Most recently, this guy in Pennsylvania, Mark Hoke, didn't even go inside an abortion clinic. He was, they pulled him together and charged him with face and he was declared not guilty because obviously not everybody might get away uh, with that in the same manner. But 2022 was a banner year. And why is this? Well, because the years leading up to um, 2022 saw a lot of rescues happening. Rescues kind of died out. Uh, after the FACE Act passed, everybody, I mean, a lot of you were around then, of course. I mean, you probably know what happened. People got cold feet. Uh, nobody wanted to take the risk. Even the leadership didn't want to take the risk. And so nobody did it, or most people didn't do it. But in 2017, uh, some folks who had been doing pro-life for quite a while decided, you know, maybe the time is ripe. Maybe, maybe it's time to test the waters again. You know, Trump was, was in office. That probably factored into it. But also some of them were getting old and they, you know, they, they had their families and whatever. And they thought, you know what, this is, this is worth a shot. And they brought along some young people with them. And so folks started doing rescues of some sort. Not every rescue involves, uh, attempting to break the face charges. Okay. Sometimes folks just go into the clinic and they, they do what's called a red rose rescue. You just, you know what sidewalk counseling is. You counsel on the sidewalk. Well, just do that inside the clinic, sit in the waiting room and counsel people in the waiting room. You give a red rose to the mothers, okay? It freaks the abortion clinic staff out, but it doesn't break the FACE Act. Other people just go in there, they counsel, and then they leave at first warning or something like that. It's sometimes referred to as an opportunity rescue. So I'm using the term broadly. It's, it, it's anything the pro-lifers do in an abortion clinic that might cause them to risk arrest. And there was an uptick in that. And arrests were made all over the country, you know? Again, old people, young people. That's me. You can't see me very well there, but, you know, these three guys have been arrested any number of times. 
quite a few clergy, at least Catholic clergy, being arrested. Um, I would say somewhere between 30 and 40 people have done rescues in the past five years now that I know of in, in, in some way, shape, or form. Okay, A lot of people just do one, and other people do multiple ones. Well, so what you're probably thinking right now is, um, why? What's the point? Why do this? Especially since the risks are apparently quite high. I mean, even people that aren't being charged with face are doing jail time. I have four friends right now in uh, Michigan doing anywhere between uh, 30 and 90 days in jail just for going inside the clinic and counseling in the clinic, you know. It's trespassing. According to our corrupt legal system, that's trespassing, all right? But, you know, trespassing is different if you're at an abortion clinic in the eyes of many judges. And so they're really coming down hard on these guys. They're starting to get coming down more hard. Uh, for a while, there weren't any charges filed. COVID kind of gave, you know, people a little bit of a lead in because they didn't want to bother with it. But they're starting to do so now. The Biden Justice Department is starting to encourage state justice departments to do this and you know, any town that's going to have an abortion clinic is likely, more likely than not to be somewhat of a blue town and have a, a justice system that uh, is not favorable to rescuers. So why do it? Right? Can't, can't we just counsel outside the abortion clinic? Are there other ways to fight abortion? And these are legitimate questions, and this is why I delayed for a while to do, a, you know, rescues. I, frankly, I mean, what I usually do this is what I usually spend my time doing in the past 14 years. I don't know how well you can see that. I go to college campuses and high schools, and I talk to people about abortion. And I still think that that is probably the best way that ordinary people can spend most of their time doing anti-abortion work. Because it's a lot easier to convince somebody abortion is wrong years before they have a crisis pregnancy than it is right at the door to try to convince them then when they're already in the crisis. Plus, you know, once people form their opinions and solidify them on this thing, it's pretty darn hard to talk them out of it. So what we need is a lot of anti-abortion people out there preaching the truth. That's why Jack Ames' uh, uh, the Defend Life Face the Truth tour in the summer is so great, you know? Yes, you just hold the signs and the cars come by, but thousands of cars see you. Yes. And yeah, I don't see thousands of students, but I talk to them in depth. You know, and they see the pictures and they can absorb the message. And even better if they take some of our literature. If we just had thousands of pro-lifers across the nation doing this, we'd be a lot farther ahead than we are right now. I'd say the reason that we're in the position we're in right now in Maryland is elsewhere is in large degree because this has been ignored. But even I decided that maybe that wasn't enough and I needed to do some more stuff. And rescue was one of the things I thought needed to be done. Um, so here's the reasoning I have behind it. Oh, that's, that comes up well. First of all, abortion is both immoral and, I would say, illegal. I won't belabor that last point too much now. I'm sure most of you probably think abortion is immoral. I hope so. If, later come, if you don't, come talk to me later. But I'd say it's actually also illegal. Now, the, our lawyer in the room might disagree with me, but here's how a layman reads the U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment. so-called Bill of Rights. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentation or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any private property be taken for public use without just compensation. No person shall be deprived of life without due process of law. Fifth Amendment. Fourteenth Amendment, the one that apparently is being used to justify abortion all over the place. Where do we got it? Um, I'll read section one. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. What do state laws that justify ab abortion do? 
they deny the unborn persons uh, the equal protection of the laws. How do they need to justify Beats me. <laughs> yeah, and we don't make them because remember it. Exactly, and we haven't made them deal with that fact yet. But my point stands, abortion is both immoral and illegal. The Constitution is the highest law of the land, right? Any state law or federal law that violates the Constitution is null and void, is not a law. Therefore, abortion is already illegal. That's what I say. Maybe someone could talk me out of it, but my presentation is based on that, that assessment. So why should we treat abortion clinics like they're legitimate businesses? You know, if somebody was conducting a rape in your neighbor's house next door or in the barber shop next door and you went in there to stop the rape, nobody is going to charge you with trespassing. <laughs> you went in there to stop a rape. It's called a defense of others or a necessity defense, right? Well, the same thing with us. Illegal activity is happening in this building. We should go there and stop it or somehow interfere with it. We shouldn't be afraid of rescuing for that reason. Point number two, personal interposition against injustice is the duty of every person, not just the police. I was looking this up online the other day. The first police force in the United States wasn't formed until like 1848 or something, or 1845. Uh, that might have been it, or, or maybe, another, I think it was the Chicago or one of these big cities. And the first police force in the world of any modern sense was, I think, the London police force sometime in the 1700s. They are an invention of the modern world. Yes, we've always had courts. Yes, we've always had sheriffs and little things like that. But organized police forces are a novelty. Not necessarily a bad thing. I can see the justification for it. But my point is, before there was police, who was responsible for uh, apprehending offenders? Yeah, the sheriff, but also the citizenry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know what a posse is? So, hey, I need, I need to deputize 12 guys. Let's go get this, this dude and bring him back here so we can face trial. The citizenry. So I think that's where the idea of a citizen's arrest came from. In the old days, if somebody picked your pro pocket on the busy street, you scream, hey, all right, stop that guy. He stole a thief. And everybody would just drop what they were doing, jump on him, and bring him back to justice. Okay? This idea that only the police can carry out arrests and only the police can help enforce the law is bogus. We've lived with it for a long time. We accept it as normal, but it's not true. All right. So when in your country, the official people who have that job ne neglect their duty, the response should not be, well, I guess nobody can enforce the law now. Shucks. There's nothing we can do. No, the responsibility defaults to us. Just like it was through most of history until quite recently. That's the other justification for rescue. Three, physical interposition is the only action pro-lifers can take that is not a compromise. And in this case, I am talking about the old traditional rescues where people were preventing people physically from entering an abortion clinic. I should say it's the only peaceful action pro-lifers can take that's not a compromise. I have respect for sidewalk counselors. I sidewalk counsel. It's a hard job. It's not fun. People turn you down all the time. They throw stuff at you. It's very difficult to talk somebody out of abortion. And when it happens, it's glorious. A life saved is a life saved. And I have respect for people that are trying to put good laws in the books. And I certainly have respect for people that do what I do because I think it's important. But let's face it. In the end of the day, we're allowing people to choose to kill if they don't want to listen to what we say. We're being effectively pro-choice. The only time where we don't compromise peacefully is when you stop somebody from doing it. You're going to do it. You got to go through me. And I think that means something important. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, because of all these things and related to them, I think abortion will end faster if we rescue, or if more of us rescue, than if nobody rescues. Hopefully I can make that case before the end of the evening. And the reason I think uh, abortion will end faster if we rescue than if uh, nobody rescues is because if we want people to believe that abortion is murder, we have to act like it's murder. I've pondered how the nation gets into the state it is. And you can blame a lot of things. You can blame artificial birth control and the public school systems and whatever. And those are probably factors. But people have always had evil intentions. They've always loved sex. They've hated responsibility. 
But what usually stops these problems and keeps them in check is when people who know what is right are revol revolted by it and they behave in accordance with their principles. You haven't seen that with abortion. If you say something is murder and then your next response is, oh shucks, I, I don't know, I guess I got to go home and deal live with it. What do you think people are going to think? Do they think they take you seriously? I wouldn't if I were them. Now, I don't know barely anybody in this room. I know a handful of people. But I challenge almost any of us to look into our hearts and consider where we spend our time, where we spent our time for the past 50 years, and the risks that we've taken, and ask yourself, am I behaving like abortion really is murder? Am I behaving like there's a Holocaust happening down the street? I don't think very many of us can say that. I, I can't say that, and I, I, I kind of live and breathe this stuff. And the world sees that, and they, sees our, they see our hypocrisy, and it gives them justification for continuing doing what they do. I've, I heard some of them speak about this, you know. They may clamor at us for being too loud and aggressive and everything, but at the end of the day, something in them knows a fake when they see it. And frankly, it would have been better had we been loud and obnoxious rather than being fakes. Now, I would be happy if everybody just spent a lot of time advocating on the street, preaching against abortion. But I know that's not all. If we were acting like abortion was real, was really murder, a lot of us would be physically intervening or doing something, crossing the property lines to stop these abortions from happening where they are happening. My website, yesiriuschurch.com, at the end of this presentation, you'll see a page with a lot of websites on there I'd like you to photograph and go to, talks about uh, these things, talks about the justifications we use to excuse ourselves from living lifestyles that are in accordance with the reality that you live in a Holocaust. I told you a lot of things I'm going to say you're not going to be comfortable with. Sorry. Please go there. I'll, I'll show you the website at the end of it. And I've got literature in accordance with that same stuff. Um... If your lifestyle is the same right now as it would be if abortion wasn't a thing, you're probably not living right. It's not going to take the same form for everybody, but if it's the same as it was, if, if, if it's the same as it would be if you lived in a peaceful nation before abortion, something's wrong. Now, let me read you a quote from a rescue author. Where did I put that book? You see where I put the orange book? Yeah, hold on. Now, this is a Manuel Solidarity by John Cavanaugh O'Keefe, which I recommend everybody reading. Um, now, I disagree with his assertion that the pro-life movement has spent a lot, a lot of time educating the public. I don't think they have. I don't think they spent nearly as much time as they should. It seems to me half the pro-life movement is political. The other half is um, working in the CPCs. Very few people are involved in education. But I, 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 I believe his conclusion here is correct. Listen to this. Currently, many adolescents are learning lessons that neither the pro-lifers nor the pro-abortionists intended to teach, and that lesson is catastrophic. On one hand, there are pro-life people saying that in just a single year in the United States alone, about 1.5 million children are being killed, that we are in the middle of the greatest war in the history of mankind, and that worldwide, one person in three is being killed, that in one generation, over one billion people had been killed by surgical abortion worldwide, by surgical abortion alone, not including abortion by drugs and devices, and so on. Pro-abortionists, on the other hand, are working hard to convince the American populace that abortion is simply not all that exciting. In their view, abortion may be unpleasant, there should be better ways to engage in non-productive sexual play, but abortion is a fact of life, and we should just relax about it. The catastrophe is that a growing number of members of the post row generation are combining the thoughts of the pro-lifers and the pro-abortionists in a way that their teachers can barely imagine. They agree that life begins at conception. I'm finding more and more people that do agree with that but are still pro-choice. And that we are engaged in a Holocaust. But they also agree that it's not a big deal. The new generation has learned that abortion and mayhem, even Holocaust, are acceptable. The teachers may be polarized, but the students integrate these two messages into a veritable witch's brew. And I think his conclusion is correct. 
our inaction, it results in a whole populace that thinks, eh, abortion is disturbing, but it's not something to take that serious, and you all need to tone it down. And I think most of our problems now are stemming from that fact. Okay. So, that is why I do things like going to the March for Life with a big banner like this. It has pictures of rescuing zo- rescuers on there. Maybe you saw it if you were with the March for Life this year. I had several of them out there. It says, the res- revive the rescue movement. Abortion clinics have no right to exist. Stop acting like they do. Trespass, or what the law would consider trespass. Physical intervention and the destruction of murder weapons are justified fundamental responses to injustice. Be a rescuer. It's the default, not the last resort. We must obey God rather than men, and I think we should. I've had people tell me, well, we, we only, we're only going to rescue if there's nothing else that's going to work. Folks, you rescue as your first option, and then you don't rescue because you find it's too hard to keep rescuing because they're going to throw you in jail or something, all right? I understand there's risks to rescue, but it shouldn't be the last thing we try. That should be the first thing that we want to try. I want to help this person. I want to stop injustice, and I can do it. And only then, when we see that it's impossible to keep doing it, do we slow down and say, okay, I'll do these other things, and I'll make it easier for me to rescue or make it easier for somebody else to rescue. We've got it backwards. We're looking for, for ways to do the job without any, 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 to end abortion without any great sacrifice to ourselves. We should have never had that as a consideration. That should have been an afterthought. The lives of the preborn kids should have been the first thing on our minds. And only secondarily, because we couldn't save them as effectively as we would hope, because there's not enough of us, you know, only then do some of us turn and go to politics and other things to straighten out all the problems that are causing these abortions to happen and make it impossible for us to do this. All right, so that kind of leads into my second point. There it is, just kidding. Part two, demanding more of your nation. Because we all can't rescue necessarily, we have to change uh, a lot of things. We have to change people's minds about abortion, but we also need to change the power structures of America. I have avoided politics most of the time, pro-life politics. I didn't think it was going anywhere. It didn't didn't seem to be producing much fruit. I have a leaflet over there that points out what I'm talking about. Most of pro-life politics for the past 50 years has been akin to a farmer that tries to reap crops without sowing any seed. He doesn't spend any time convincing people that abortion is evil. They, don't, they, just, they, they just talk about it amongst themselves, and then they try to get out the vote really good and campaign against abortion. Of course, you're not going to have much success that way, and that's why they end up compromising and toning down the abortion rhetoric during their campaigns and shuffling this way and that, and then hopefully they'll get in and they can change something, you know. And of course, you get results like our governor down in Virginia who deliberately hid his pro-life principles and you know the pro-lifers thought well, we'll just get him in we'll just get him in he'll change things now he's a pro, you know he's supporting a 15-week ban most abortions happen before 15 weeks and even that ban couldn't get passed because the you know the the, the house of delegates in Virginia was too pro-abortion because the pro-lifers didn't campaign strongly enough and teach people but politics can be an effective tool if you do it right. And it might not change things in the short term because it takes a while for new ideas to saturate into the minds of people, but it can change things in the long term. You had two campaigns run in Maryland back in November. You had Dan Cox, who ran a general conservative campaign. Didn't talk much about abortion. I guess he talked more about economy, I guess, than anything else. And you had Michael Peruca running for attorney general, who said that to heck with Maryland's laws or well, and their corrupt, twisted ide- ideologies. Abortion is against the Constitution, and I'm going to prosecute abortionists if I get into office. At least that, that's what I understand he was saying. You know, Both of them lost election. Who wasted their time and who, who used the campaign effectively? Peruca did, right? Peruca did. They both lost election. But he changed the paradigm by saying things that nobody else had ever said. He campaigned on something that wasn't going to get him elected. But he used the bully pulpit to change people's minds, to open up people's ideas a little bit. And that's the right way to do politics. And that's why I'd like to introduce, where is it? 
Oops, where is it? Oh, it's not here. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Most of, most people that campaign in the Republican ticket are pro-life. Uh, it's just that even in, in ch case of Amanda, Amanda Chase, my what? Yeah, I don't know what happened to the. Uh, hold on, I gotta get, I gotta get something. So what you should be seeing up here is a, a pic that says the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Uh, no, it should be right there. That's okay. It's not your fault. It's just probably a, you know, a graphics problem. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate being uh, propagated most recently in the past few years by uh, Pastor Matt Truella out of Wisconsin. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate declares that when the higher-ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral laws, policies, or court opinions, the lower or lesser-ranking civil authority has a God-given right and duty to refuse obedience to the higher authority. If necessary, the lesser authority may even actively resist the higher authority. In other words, to interpose. When citizens interpose, it takes the form of something like rescue, civil disobedience. When a magistrate interposes, it's the lesser magistrate doctrine. Magistrates or anybody with, you know, real elected or appointed authority. And lesser magistrates or anybody that's lower down on the totem pole than a higher magistrate. A governor is a lesser magistrate to a president. A mayor or a city council is lesser magistrate to a governor, okay, on down the line. A cop is the least magistrate of all. What this doctrine asserts is that every one of those guys, or women as it might be the case, their first duty is to just do what is right. And hopefully, if the laws of your jurisdiction are legal, it means doing what is legal. But doing what is right. Obey God rather than men with your given authority. That's not happening. But it should be happening. Yeah. You don't just follow orders. Because what is legal is not always what is righteous. So the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine has a lot of history and justification behind it. So, for example, in the Bible, uh, the Hebrew midwives, they weren't law enforcement officials, but they were magistrates of sorts. They were employees of the state. They were ordered by Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrew male children. They refused. Did God say, oh, you didn't obey your, your earthly masters. You, you know, you, you, I, I condemn you. No, he rewarded them for disobeying Pharaoh's wicked command. In the center, David and Jonathan right there. This is a scene depicting David fleeing from King Saul after the king decided he was going to kill him. Both of these guys work for the king. They're employees of the king. They're magistrates. The king decides, okay, David, you have to die. The right thing to do is for him to turn himself in and be executed, right? No, he fled the king. He didn't kill Saul. We all know he spared Saul's life in the Bible, but he also didn't obey Saul. And neither did Jonathan, the prince regent. In fact, he helped the escapee, David, escape because he knew what his father was doing was wrong. He was a righteous lesser magistrate. Right there you see a picture on the right of um, the prophet Daniel in Babylon, very high up on the chain of uh, the Babylonian authorities, or um, excuse me, at that time it was uh, yeah, the Persian and Mede authorities. Uh, Darius makes a law, you, everybody must pray to me for so, such and such a number of days and no other God. Daniel immediately prays to his own God. He was a righteous lesser magistrate. He set the standard for everybody else around him. And there's other examples too. It has a long pedigree in history in Western jurisprudence. This is uh, John of Salisbury in a book called Polycratic, Polycraticus. He was a, a legal theologian back in the 14th century. Loyal soldiers should sustain the power of the ruler so long as it is exercised in subjection to God and follows his ordinances. But if it resists and opposes the divine commandments and wishes to make me share in its war against God, then with unrestrained voice, I answer back that God must be preferred before any man on earth. That's 1159 A.D. That's the Middle Ages, guys. All right? 
think of this as the king rules completely, that everybody must obey the king. No. Even back then, there were folks that knew that you had to obey God rather than men, and the lesser magistrate was the guy that needed to do it above anyone else. John Knox, the great reformer, for now on the common song of all men is we must obey our kings, be they good or bad, for God has so commanded. True it is, God has commanded kings be obeyed, but likewise true it is that in things which they commit against his glory, he has commanded no obedience. This is true then, now as it was then. Uh, William Blackstone, the father of English law, basically, law commentaries, could pull out lots of other quotes, but this was a guy... I mean, the Founding Fathers of America poured over his work when they were writing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, in other words, the Bible, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human laws should be suffered to contradict these. William Blackstone, Commentaries on the Laws of England. Now people don't read Blackstone anymore because it, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable and difficult to justify a lot of our policies <laughs> when you're reading Blackstone. Patrick Henry at the Virginia House of Burgesses, excellent example of the doctrine of lesser magistrates in practice. It was the colonial assemblies, generally speaking, that were the um, voice box for the people to, uh, to defy King George III in, in the lead up to the Revolutionary War. The people just didn't act alone. Their representatives in the colonial assemblies had something to say about this. They wrote the king. They wrote parliament. We can't do this. You've got to repeal these taxes. It violates the colonial charters, etc., etc. They were interposing between the wicked king and the tyrant and those he wished to abuse, exactly as they should have done. So this is something that has to play in the uh, American history as well. After the formation of the American uh, state, you know, it wasn't too long before the federal government tried to snatch too much power for itself. It passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. I don't know everything about those acts, but I, I, I believe it made it a crime to criticize the government, essentially. And several of the states cried out against this, including Virginia, the home of Madison and Jefferson. They had resolutions against the Alien and Sedition Acts. They said here, the states who are parties thereto, parties of the U.S. Constitution, have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities' rights and liberties appertaining to them. I'm going to step over here. Oh, no. Am I in the way? Yeah, almost in the way. Uh, Kentucky said something very similar, that whenever the general government, the federal government, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. Going forward in time, you all heard of the Fugitive Slave Act. That's where southern states convinced Congress to uh, force northern states that were anti-slavery to turn in escaped slaves and send them back to their masters down south. A lot of private citizens in the north were very unhappy with this. But it was the state of Wisconsin that took it a, a step further. There was a fugitive slave in Wisconsin named Joshua Glover living somewhere, I, I don't know exactly where, I think northern or mid-central Wisconsin. Um, four federal marshals deputized, came up there to be basically be slave catchers, to grab him and send him back south. <laughs> they put him in a uh, little jail down there in, the, in this town. 5,000 people, led by the, the sheriff of that town, surrounded the, the, uh, the jail, broke Glover out of the jail, set him free, and then the, <laughs> the sheriff arrested those federal marshals and put them in jail. <laughs> All right. Yeah. At least that's how I understand the story. Um, and then, of course, this, this opened up a real long, big debate uh, between Wisconsin and the federal government. Uh, the federal government was just fuming and raged that they had even tried this. And Wisconsin wrote back and said, look, you, the fugitive slave law is nonsense. OK, check it out. This assumption of jurisdiction by the federal judiciary uh, I think it was uh, the Supreme Court that was or, or also stepping into the case as well. Uh, and in the said case, and without process, is an act of undelegated power and therefore without authority, void, and of no force. They followed it up with this. Resolved, the government formed by the Constitution of the United States was not the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, but that, as in all other cases of compact, and that is what the Constitution is, it's a compact of the various states, among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself. Wisconsin Legislature, 1859. It's kind of ironic that 
right before the Civil War, where we usually think of the southern states advocating for states' rights. It was the northern states for a very long time that were rebuking a, a slave-holding, controlled Congress for the overreach of their federal authority. Going forward, um, I'm afraid to say that in, during the 20th century, there was a, a lot of the forgetting about the doctrine of lesser magistrates. Because of the growth of the federal government, many of the local governments and the state governments started to think of themselves as simply the implementers of wicked federal programs. It's not what they're supposed to be. They're not just the, uh, the strong men that put in practice every stupid idea that comes out of Washington, D.C., or in your case, from Annapolis. But they've started to act like that. However, there are notable exceptions recently. In 2021, when Joe Biden got in uh, power, he had an executive order issued an assault weapons ban, right? Most of the states went along with it. I know there were some that didn't. But notably, Newton County, Missouri. The state of Missouri was just going to go out along with it completely. Newton County, Missouri, the, see here, the, the county uh, commissioners got together and wrote an ordinance declaring that any infringement on the Second Amendment by any county official would result in his being removed from office. And they ordered the local sheriffs to arrest any federal official who entered Newton County to try to take somebody's assault rifle away. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure uh, that transpired to the rest of the Missouri and everybody still has their guns, you know. So it, it works. When, when lesser magistrates stand up, good things can happen. Just got to convince them it's worth their time. COVID opened up a whole new avenue for all sorts of uh, government tyranny and therefore new possibilities for lesser magistrates to do what is right. The guy there at the Gay Pride Parade is Governor J.B. Pritzker of, of Illinois. Excellent guy. Yeah. Uh, he decided that all businesses, I don't know exactly the timeline, he decided that all businesses during COVID had to shut down until he said so. Nobody can open, you can't open your barber shop or your gas station or whatever it is until I say you can go. And everybody was going to cave to this until little Madison County down there, not really the most populous or important county in Illinois, you know, what are they going to do? They got together and told the governor, uh, no, we're going to open up our businesses right now. Everybody can open up, and you can go pound sand. He had three days of press conferences saying how wicked this was and how they were defying his just authority, and you better get in line, and this is my executive offer, and you're going to let people die, and blah, 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 blah. And then on the seventh day, he got word that the state police <laughs> decided they weren't going to close any businesses. The whole state police of Illinois, you know, we're just not going to do it, Governor, just deal with it, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not our job to close people's businesses unjustifiably. Uh, I'm, I, I didn't figure out yet whether that, uh, you know, the chief of police was a government appointee, whether it was Pritchard's appointee or whether he was elected. He, would, he was probably elected himself, so he doesn't answer directly to the governor, but it would be pretty cool if he was an appointee in doing that. And the next day, Governor Pritzker rescinded his order and people could open their businesses. So again, good things can happen when lesser magistrates stand up. So the lesser magistrate doctrine has a long pedigree. It is a justifiable uh, way for local officials to do what is right and interpose against a tyrant on behalf of the people that they are serving. And I got other examples too that I didn't put, put on here. Uh, like all the sheriffs revolted in you know, the local sheriffs in Illinois later on against an assault weapons ban. And, and you know, they, they've really been a bulwark to prevent certain types of tyranny throughout the states. So that's the good news. Where does that leave us with abortion? What have lesser magistrates done to protect preborn children and defy wicked governments that want them to die. Well, I'm sorry to say, not much. In general, for the past 50 years, your average lesser magistrate, statewide, local, anything, has not touched abortion with a 25-foot pole. And we've let them get away with it. 
they've had the cooperation of the pro-life movement. Here's Kristen Hawkins, head of the Student, Students for Life of America, one of our premier pro-life organizations. They're really not, but has a big name. People take their word for things. Very influential. And what she says right here is kind of the way that most pro-life organizations and most pro-life politicians have thought uh, for the past 50 years. This is right after the Dobbs case reversed Roe v. Wade. Here's her sigh of relief. 50 years of standing at the Supreme Court's door waiting for something to happen is over. Hallelujah. You, you'll notice I circled a comment up there. That's my comment. And if you can't see it, I wrote, here's a question. Why did we spend 50 years standing there waiting for something to happen when the court's decisions are not the final arbiter of the Constitution anyway and did not in any way revoke the anti-abortion laws of the states? You'd be hard-pressed to find an anti-abortion leader, a pro-life leader, who will not say, Roe v. Wade was unconstitutional. They would constantly say this. Don't let your memory slip you. I, I talk to these people for... We say this. Roe v. Wade's unconstitutional. Okay. So that means you don't have to follow it, right? Oh, no, no. We, we have to. I mean, it's, 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 it's the law of the land, but how is, it, how is it the law of the land if it's unconstitutional? Well, the Supreme Court decided, and we just can't... You know, we can't... You know, we've got to go along with the way things... Are. It's double talk. It's nonsense. But it was very convenient nonsense. Because if the Supreme Court's word is final, and if there's nothing you can do, there's nothing you have to do. You don't have to interpose. You don't have to take any risks. You don't have to campaign. You can campaign against abortion, but you don't have to do anything. You're not required to keep your campaign promises. There's nothing you can, there's nothing you do, out of my hands. So many of these guys, these politicians that many of us voted for, secretly they were like this. They were so glad that Roe v. Wade was the so-called law of the land, and we were all too, so stupid to think that it was the law of the land, because that gave them plausible deniability. They didn't have to take any action. It was a great sim... And frankly, most pro-lifers didn't want to take any action either and suffer the consequences of defying Washington. It was a great symbiotic relationship we had with our pro-life politicians, a symbiotic relationship of apathy and of selfishness. So... What would usually happen in the states was stuff like this. So here's Kay Ivey. She's the, she was, I think, the former governor of Alabama. I think this is, yeah, 2019. Great governor. Alabama loved her. She's a very conservative, lovely grandma-like character. She signed, in 2019, uh, an incredibly zealous anti-abortion law. It was perfect in almost every way. No, no, no um, uh, exceptions for... Uh, you know, health exceptions or rape or anything like that. Now, it didn't criminalize people taking abortion pills in their privacy in their own home, which I think is a problem. We can talk about that later. But otherwise, it was pretty darn good. All right? And everybody, everybody uh, passionately applauded her. And then, on the very day she signed this bill, she said this. At least for the short term, she wrote in a public statement, this bill may be similarly unenforceable. As citizens of this great country, we must always respect the authority of the U.S. Supreme Court, even when we disagree with their decisions. This is one of your most conservative governors in one of the most conservative pro-life states of the nation saying that she's going to pass a law, sign a law against abortion, and then do nothing. Because at that time, Dobbs hadn't passed and the Supreme Court was still telling her what to do. She was a lesser magistrate, and she failed to interpose, and so did every one of her contemporaries, every one of her peers. For 50 flipping years, folks. Yeah, there wasn't. Not a single one. It's very convenient for them. Oh, yeah. That's right. They very much reinforced it, and, 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 and that's why so many of us on the ground think it's true. And when other pe new people run for office, they, they, they campaign with that assumption. They don't campaign saying, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to defy the tyrants. We have to change that. They campaign thinking, there's nothing I can do, at least on this point. Yeah. So anyway, these are fallacies, this, the idea that Supreme Court decisions 
are the law of the land as if they made law. But you know what else is a fallacy? The idea that the Constitution says nothing about abortion. I respect the Dobbs decision, okay? I respect Samuel Alito and what he was doing, and I'm not an attorney. But I can read the same Constitution he reads. I think the Constitution is anti-abortion. It's not silent on the issue. It's pro-life. Granted, the, the people of the, the, the 19th century didn't know as much about human development as we did. They kind of thought that maybe the, they didn't know how the baby formed in the womb exactly. But I say with a lot of confidence that when they knew that a, pers- a, ba- a baby was there, that baby they thought of as a person, just like you and me. Right. I would say so. Um, so we've accepted a lot of lies. Now, there have been attempts right before Dobbs during the COVID period for some localities to defy tyrants in support of, the, of uh, preborn children. There have been a little. So you don't see this very well, okay, but this is a the shot screen, uh, screenshot of a website called Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn. This guy, who is just a big black blotch there, his name is Mark Lee Dixon. He's a, a head of, like, Texas Right to Life of, of the East Coast. And he started going around the country getting little towns, like little, like, 500-person towns, to pass resolutions saying abortion is abolished in our town. All right? Okay. Not a bad idea. All right? Um, I, the idea, I suppose, was that if you get enough of these towns together that write these resolutions, eventually you might be able to convince the state to do it, all right? Or he might have a court case that would go up to Congress and do something, but Dobbs happened and it wasn't necessary. But that's not really lesser magistrate because I read a lot of these resolutions. They have no teeth to them. There's no teeth. There's no enforcement policy. Abortion's illegal, but we're not going to do anything about it. You don't suffer anything by, by opening up an abortion clinic. Well, yeah. Right. Uh, and a lot of them, again, explicitly said that a woman could abort her own child privately with abortion pills, and we're not going to touch that one either. Now, the one exception that people talked about quite a bit was Lubbock, Texas, because Lubbock, Texas succeeded in driving a couple abortion clinics out of town by their saying, okay, if you abort a kid, anybody in Lubbock, or anybody, anybody really, can sue you for like $10,000. It's a civil suit. And the abortionists in, in Lubbock didn't want to deal with that, so they did, they did close down and move out of town. All right? Okay, that's something. That's more, something. That's more than nothing. But again, they allowed women to kill their children in the privacy of their own homes, again. And don't underestimate how common that's going to be now. It's probably been very common before. We just didn't know about it because the pro-life movement didn't talk about it because they want to think that we're winning when really with pills you can probably kill most kids right up to 12 weeks, which is when most abortions happen anyway, okay? So you just, a lot of these abortion clinic bans, by the way, a lot of these abortion clinic bans that are happening right now, they're just abortion, they're just abortion clinic bans. No state has banned abortion. They just said that somebody else can't kill your baby. You can kill your baby. But I digress. Lubbock, even there, that's not the lesser magistrate doctrine. That was the magistrates stepping back and allowing the people to do their job. Otherwise, they would have made it a criminal crime, right? And the government of, of Lubbock would have come after you. But no, they're going to leave it in the hands of the people. We're going to sue the abortionist out of business. Okay, why is the serpents, you know, uh, peaceful as doves, gentle as doves? Still, we want men and women that are going to do their jobs and not leave it to us. But then Dobbs happened, and that kind of became, in some sense, uh, Irrelevant, at least in those towns. Texas, of course, passed a heartbeat bill, and it was on the same uh, the same kind of thing as Lubbock had passed. You can sue the abortionist out, and yes, it did send abortion clinics out, but it had the same problems that the that the Lubbock bill had. It's allowing chemical abortion, and I want to point out that. Where we are right now in the country, we, a lot of people have a lot of enthusiasm for the wrong reasons. Uh, I've already stated some of that already. You know, chemical abortion is exploding. The Biden administration's, administration is going to make sure that pharmacies can continue dispensing this stuff everywhere. And even if it was to become illegal at some point, you're going to have people 
sending abortion pills illegally through the mail. I don't know how you're going to stop that. That's why convincing the public to reject abortion is so important. That's why we need people in the streets. No, it's prescription right now. It's prescription. But if you're going to break the law and mail somebody a pill illegally, who's going to stop you? You know, it's... Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. 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 And I have no doubt that the same class of men, the politicians who allowed Roe v. Wade to stop them from doing anything substantial for 50 years, will be overjoyed if the Supreme Court or some federal court finds another excuse to justify abortion here or there, or if they pass another law that somehow takes it out of their hands, or if there's some other way around it, abortion pill or what have you. They're just looking for ways to dodge their responsibilities. And we've got to recognize that and start getting rid of them and demanding lesser magistrates that do what is right. This is why I had this sign at the March for Life. It insulted a lot of people. They didn't like it, but I'm, this is how I feel. Forgive me. Um, I'm not coming down necessarily on the Supreme Court. They finally kind of did their job, at least most of it, but we didn't do our job in the meantime. Roe didn't need to be overturned. It should have been defied. We let weak pro-life leaders use Roe as an excuse for 49 years. Courts don't make law. Don't let them block abortion bans now, but they will. It did need to be overturned. Well, it should have. I mean, it was. It was a bad decision. Yes, it should have been overturned. It was always wrong. Right. I, and I'm just saying that we didn't need to wait for it to be overturned. You know. What do I think that lesser magistrates ought to do? What do I, with my no law enforcement experience, say? Well, I ask for a lot, folks. Lesser magistrates should refuse to arrest citizens who interpose on behalf of preborn children. If I were to go to Baltimore uh, Monday morning and stand in front of the clinic and chain myself to the door, the police ought to show up like, okay, cool. And, and at the very least, they shouldn't interfere with me. They should let us do our duty. If they're not going to do theirs completely, we should be able to do ours. We should be telling lesser magistrates to do that. Police officers, county officials, they should run on a platform like that. But they should go further. Lesser magistrates should close businesses that sell abortion-causing drugs or provide abortion services. Now, I realize that in any town that has an abortion clinic at this point, you're probably not going to get somebody elected, at least in the short term, who would do something like that. But you could get somebody elected in a little town where there's a pharmacy dispensing abortion pills. The duty of the lesser magistrate is to shut them down, regardless of what Joe Biden's FDA says, regardless of what the Supreme Court has said. They're selling murder pills. They need to be shut down. Lesser magistrates should arrest and prosecute anyone guilty of causing an abortion, even their own. I think that should not be controversial. It is. Anybody that kills children, even if it's the woman killing a child in private, should face some criminal, some criminal penalties for what's happening. Yes, not every case is the same. Some people do this. Women do this under coercion. I know some cases where they actually were forced to do it, although that's rare. But that, that's no reason to give everybody a carte blanche immunity from the consequences of their actions. We need to get over this, get over this, this fear of prosecuting people that kill their children, especially abortionists, but also people that do it privately or, or a group of people that come together to do it. Now, I understand that if somebody were to do that on a local level and arrest somebody and they would go to court, the judges would, at some point, you get up to a high enough level of judge, you're going to find somebody who's pro-abortion and they'll release the person. Okay. So what? Arrest the next person that does it. Keep doing it. I want to cause a confrontation between the lesser magistrates and the higher magistrates. We shouldn't be afraid of that. All right? At the, we might not be able to control what every magistrate does, but at least we can make our communities uncomfortable for people that want to kill children, either their own or somebody else's. And this will reverberate throughout the nation if people started uh, 
standing on those principles. Like I said, I'm th trying to think long term, not short term. And finally, lesser magistrates should ignore higher magisterial decisions seeking to negate their policies against abortion. And this is just where the rubber meets the road, folks, because, of course, if a municipality or I guess a state, not so much a state, but at this point a municipality decides they're, they're going to do these things, there's going to be repercussions from the state government if they're doing it within a pro-choice state like this state or like Michigan. But it's starting to happen. And we need to push for it to happen faster. If I'm going to be interposing and going to jail for 11 years, sure as heck, every local sheriff can just do his job and interfere with this butchery that's happening right under his nose. That's what we hire him to do. So... That's what I think should happen. This is a big ask, isn't it? But I don't I, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm asking people to do anything other than what they are appointed to do. And that's why I had this sign at the March for Life. You can't end abortion while obeying wicked rulers. We spend so much time obeying wicked men. We just, you know, we just we forget that we swear loyalty to the Constitution. Every public official swears loyalty to the to this Constitution, not to somebody's false interpretation of the Constitution. Or their stupid policies that have no relation to the Constitution. Here's a generic picture of a local sheriff. Not in my town. We're going to start defying abortion governments. Elect courageous local leaders. Ban abortion town by town. Not just a resolution by an ordinance. Withhold taxes to pro-abortion governments. Reject handouts from pro-abortion governments. We should be... I mean, this is another thing altogether, but pro-life citizenry should be banding together to not pay their taxes until abortion is illegal nationwide. Because why am I paying money to a government that's doing barbarism like this? You should be strangling them for this, you know, and every state that does the same thing. And we shouldn't be afraid to not, we shouldn't be taking their handouts either because that's how they, that's how they catch you. That's how they make you do what they want you to do. Or at least, ostensibly, that's what's going to happen. Um... So, uh, where was I? Ban abortion town by town. Eventually, if you do enough of this, there won't be any more room for them to hide. It's just that we have to get started. We have to start somewhere. What does this mean for you? Oh, what good will it do? Yeah, I forgot I had that slide. Yeah. Yeah, we could do a lot of good in summary. It would prevent or at least reduce the number of abortions occurring in your, in your jurisdiction. If there's no abortionist there, if there's no place to get abortion pills legally in your town, it's harder for people to get abortions, all right? That's going to reduce abortions. I know they can do them illegally. I know they can drive out of town. It's not the whole story, but it's going to make it, it's going to inconvenience them. And they sh why should they be conveniently killing children? Number two, it would encourage other anti-abortion jurisdictions to interpose. If more than one town does it, it gives the next town courage, and it gives the next county courage. Maybe a whole state will do it. Interposition is essential. That's the reason I rescue, by the way, to give the rest of you courage. And finally, we send a clear message to America that abortion really is murder. When the citizenry puts their security on the line, as I kind of did a little bit, and when magistrates do their jobs, regardless of what the federal or state government says, when they obey their duty to God... It sends a message that we think abortion actually is murder and we're going to act like it. Now, you're in Maryland. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know what happened here. I know that uh, your state legislature passed this. I don't know if you want to call it a law yet because it needs to be voted on, but this this pre-law that you're going to write abortion into the state constitution. Everybody kind of thinks it's probably going to pass because there's enough foolish people in Maryland and not enough righteous people. Yeah. It may very well not be, you know. Wow. 
That's disheartening. I admit it. Well, I want to tell you something that you can do. And I tell you, and we can do it in this room. Virginia has an election this year. We don't have anything in North Carolina, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky. And we need national presence. We need to get in. Tell us how we can help. You've got to take the state Senate. If you take the state Senate in Virginia, they'll control the House and the Senate and get passed election law. And if that that rascal Yunkin won't sign election reform to where you can open up the, the ballot process because I understand Virginia has some of the most restricted. You cannot access their records. Right. Okay? That's got to be fixed. And, and if we don't, if, if Virginia doesn't get that fixed this year, Trump doesn't have a chance, or the Republican nominee, whoever that might be, doesn't have a chance. To win. I think if the Republican nominee can win Virginia in a free, fair, and transparent election, and that's what we've got to get to. We've got to get there. You mean abortion records? Uh, he's talking about election records. Um, I, I did want to save most questions till the end, but, sir, you did have your hand up for a second. I'll just, if you want to speak quickly. Maybe the problem is what, what we are fighting, you know, there's people passionately pro a Second Amendment, and I am, and all the government, all the sheriffs in Illinois are fighting. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, because God is real. Of course. We don't use, if we don't let God have, the, have his power in this world, nothing's happening. You know, I'm not, I mean, that's, an, it, it wasn't the sort of thing I was going on, but it is it, uh, an important point. Um, I, don't, I don't have a direct line to God, you know, in the, in the way that the prophets did, but I think there is precedence to say that the reason uh, we have so much wicked things happening to us is a punishment for our refusal to take care of little babies. I mean, we really deserve it, folks. I mean, you, you get the government you deserve, and we have neglected our first, some of our first and foremost duties for so long. Why are we surprised? But, uh, Don, let me... Not quite yet. I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah. I know I've probably gone long. I, I, I didn't get too many time to practice. Got you. So what I hear, at least in this room, is there's a lot of negativity about the possibility of Maryland's elections. Okay. Now, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't say that's a reason to just assume that it's a far-gone conclusion that this uh, stupid, you know, thing will be passed in November. But let's say that it is. Let's say that it is under, under uh, suspicious electoral uh, actions, okay? All the more reason, all the more justification for the localities to tell Annapolis to go pound sand. If they're going to do wicked things on the state level, you, you can't always, in, you can't handle what happens in Annapolis or Baltimore necessarily, but you can handle what happens here. The lesser magistrates, you got to elect local lesser magistrates that do the right thing. But that means, yes, but that means having citizenry that's willing to take risks too and suffer the consequences because it will come down on you. Like it came on down on me, okay? Of course. Yes. Now, is it harder to defy Washington, D.C. or to defy Annapolis? I don't know. I mean, Washington, D.C. has a U.S. military and nuclear rockets and everything on their side. And they haven't come down, they haven't blown Texas away or Alabama yet for supposedly banning abortion. 
the response has been kind of weak. I ran into, on January 6th, 2021, yes, I was in Washington, January 6th, 2021. I was not at the Capitol, though. I had too much stuff over my shoulder. I met people coming back from the Capitol. I was there to preach the lesser magistrate doctrine to people. Because although some presidents are better than others, the problem is with a lot of us, we, we look to the presidency, save us, save us, when really it's down here that we need to be taking up responsibility. Anyway, I caught people coming back from the, uh, from the Capitol event. Guess who I met? Abby Johnson. Anybody not know who Abby Johnson is? Yes, of course. The Planned Parenthood director that left Planned Parenthood and became pro-life. She is famous for leaving Planned Parenthood and accepting the right principles. She is infamous for putting a monkey wrench in a lot of the things that more zealous anti-abortion people in Texas were trying to do. It was her influence and the influence of people like hers that prevented uh, Texas from abolishing abortion two, maybe three years before it actually did pass its current anti-abortion laws. Because people like her, and there are a lot of them, were saying, and she had a big platform, if you pass this if you pass this anti-abortion law, the courts will just strike it down. Of course, there he is, judicial fallacy again, as if you, you have to do what they say. And also, uh, Washington will, will, will cut funding for all the nice programs. My, my disabled children won't have funding for their, their, their physical therapy and whatever, because she does have disabled children. Now, I understand how somebody would care about their children and whatever. I'm sorry? It may have been heard, but it was also uh, Abby Johnson. She said that, too. Yeah. I mean, they've all adopted children, which is a good thing to do. But I asked her, look, I, I confronted her about it because I could recognize her face. She's nationwide famous. Ab Abby, tell me the truth. Why would you oppose something like that just because they might cut funding for these programs? I mean, yeah, there's disabled kids and they matter, but is their quality of life more important than the lives of thousands and thousands of Texan babies? And she kind of shuffled her feet. Didn't know what to say. It, yeah, it is. They, and they've bought a lot of this off like that. Well, she's kind of changed her tune, if you've been paying attention. After Texas passed, it's not perfect, but better than normal abortion ban. We waited to see what would happen, and she, she went on the record. She said, look, Washington hasn't come down on them. They haven't suffered anything. The National Guard hasn't been mobilized and marched down into the streets of Austin to force Texas to do what we wanted, they wanted to do. It hasn't happened. They haven't cut funding. So if the national government's not going to do that, can we be so certain that a state government would do that to a locality? And of course, as you're pointing out, what business have we of taking their handouts anyway? You know, There are risks of uh, defying the state government. But physical coercion, the thing that everybody fears, highly unlikely for that to actually happen, especially if the lesser magistrates are the ones standing up. Historically, lesser magistrates standing up on behalf of the people, yes, you have examples where it didn't work, American Revolution. But generally speaking, when people with authority take it upon themselves to interpose between the tyrant and those who would do wrong things, it works out pretty well. The tyrant backs down. Because the tyrant is just one man, okay? And his cautiary, or whatever, that, how you pronounce that. When I was arrested, it was the FBI doing the job. It wasn't Joe Biden. He didn't bang on my door, right? It wasn't, it wasn't uh, what's his name, the head of the DOJ right now? Garland. Garland. He didn't show up. I never saw his face. It was these agents doing his dirty work. If the low low lesser magistrates don't do the dirty work of Annapolis, of Washington, they can't do anything. All right? We may be a technocracy, but not really. People still do all the work. Human beings. And yes, there may be loss of some state funding, but that hasn't happened anywhere so far. And there may be loss of corporate investment, but that has usually backfired where it's been tried in the past couple of years. There are risks for lesser magistrates standing up, but a lot less risk than I took when I rescued. All right, Lesser magistrate might, who knows, if, it, if it's a, a sheriff and the mayor is uh, pro-abortion, he might fire the sheriff, okay, it, it, unless he's elected as a sheriff. Well, it depends on how it works, yeah. 
If it's a police officer, the cop could lose his job. I understand that. But for anybody who's elected by the people, there's very little that higher level authority in America can do. You've got America. It's America, right? It's not Russia. The problem with Russia is that everything's extremely centralized. Always was. You know, every local official, they take an oath to obey the king or to the party or whatever. We don't say that anymore. We take oaths to obey the law. We have every authority. Lesser matter needs to stand up. So, while it is a big ask, it's not that big. And we need to be the sort of people in the Republican Party, if we're a Republican, or whatever party you belong to, independent, who demand that you only elect candidates that say, at least on this issue, that you're going to defy the state. That should be the first and foremost thing, in my opinion. Defy the state. You're, you, you're not going to abort children in my county or my, uh, my city if, if I can find you. All right? Hold on. I'm almost done. Is it worth it? Ask him. All right? And I, I waited till the end to show this. I'm sure you've all seen murdered children before, but really, they're murdered on the dollar bill every day. It's because of money that m usually most of us have hesitated to do what is necessary. It's money that keeps most people from dedicating time to educating their neighbors about abortion because they need to be at work. They need to make a lot of money. I'm not going to make a lot of money being an anti-abortion advocate. I got to take part-time jobs. I'm never going to never going to have a real successful career. If I'm a felon, I got to I got to become an entrepreneur. That's a I don't know how I'm going to do that, but you know, I'm not going to be rich. You go to jail, you're not going to earn money there. They're going to try to take your, take, uh, take your money from you through fines and everything like that. That's another thing. We don't pay fines when we, when we are arrested and rescued. We let them drag us out. Well, I'm not going to cooperate as much as possible. I'm not going to cooperate with an unjust police action. But that's another story. It's money that keeps the states and the politicians from doing their jobs more than anything else. That and just social acceptance of their wickedness. It's money. We've got to get over it. The children are losing their lives. What are we going to lose? We're going to lose some money. We're going to lose some, we might have to, some stress. We might lose some time. Some of you might spend some time in jail. It's worth it. And I think that's the only argument I need to make. Interposition. Demand more of yourself. Demand more of your nation. If we just start doing that, I don't think anything can stop us. And God is with you. So, I'll leave this up here, and I'll take some questions. These are all websites I'd urge you to go to. You got my website up there, GetSeriousChurch.com. Uh, you got DefyTyrants.com. That is the website for the Lesser Magistrate Project. Again, I urge you to maybe take some of the materials up there. CDs are $5, books are 10 Everything else is free. Red Rose Rescue. Learn about the rescue movement that's happening to give support for the rescuers, and please consider... Rescuing yourself, hook up with people that are. It's not as risky as you think it is. And finally, uh, j45.com. When you turn your phones back on, which I think after questions I'll do that, I want you to go to j immediately go to j45.com and sign the petition there. The abortion mill where we rescued at last year, right before they arrested us, my friends found a, hu a box of 115 murdered children, five of which were clearly aborted illegally. All abortions illegal, but they were particularly aborted illegal because they violated the Born Alive Infants Protection Act and the partial birth abortion ban. I held the kids in my hands, okay? There's no way they could have been abor aborted legally. But right now, the DC medical examiner has been holding on to them for, for a year illegally and uh, doing nothing, doing nothing. Federal crime, doing nothing. Go to jfor5.com, sign the petition to get them to, to do their jobs. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. It's a very very left-leaning pro-life group that's doing this, but they're doing great things over there in Washington, D.C., of all people. And also check this out. This is the, uh, well, you'll just see it when you go there, equalprotectionforposterity.com. Equal okay.